Speakers, we're going to turn to um, Tom Fournier right now. For those of you that watch part one, you know that Tom and I go way back about 20 years ago, we started reenacting um, around the same time, but in, in different groups. And um, Tom, Tom started in the 41st Regiment of Foot, and he quickly rose through um, the ranks of the 41st. Um, but he's got an incredible passion for this hobby. Um, and an incredible amount of knowledge, um, especially on that 41st Regiment. And you saw that played out when he was talking about the Battle of the Thames on our earlier talk. So he's going to follow that up with um, essentially what happened to a lot of those prisoners of war after the um, Battle of Moravian Town or the Battle of the Thames. Um, and also some of the other um, POWs from the War of 1812. So we're really thrilled. Um, to welcome Tom back, and um, I have to go and uh, check some emails. But just before Tom starts, um, quickly, if you have any questions for Tom throughout uh, the talk, I will be monitoring uh, the YouTube chat, so you're welcome to put them there. If you don't want them to be public, you're welcome to send me um, a quick email, and um, Tom will stop periodically, and I will uh, forward those questions to him and um, he can answer questions as we go. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tom with our thanks. Thank you, Chris. All right. Um, it's funny, I, I presented this in 2010, at what was the Living History Conference in, in London, Ontario. And after doing the, the retreat up the Thames, Battle of the Thames, it, it just seemed like this was a natural companion because it's kind of a continuation of that story. But we learn a lot about not just the 41st as prisoners, uh, they're British regulars, um, the Royal Navy, American soldiers. Um, so it's, it's a fairly far reaching topic. Um, you know, and I thought this was a rather interesting experience. I started out reaching, researching this topic with an awareness that a large number of 41st desertions and deaths happened after Moravian Town. And I had a preconceived notion of what I would find, but as I found my research, I found it led me down a much different path. I had difficulty limiting the, the talk. There's so many interesting threads and it's such a deep and complex aspect of, of the War of 1812 that seldom talked about. So here's a rough outline of the path that, that we're going to follow today. And Chris, can I ask you to mute your microphone? So we're picking up your typing there. So yes, my apologies. No, no problem. So we'll roughly follow the, the plight of the prisoners of the 41st Regiment that were captured at Moravian Town, but along the way, we'll gain insights into a much broader array of British and American prisoners through the War of 1812. So we'll get a little bit of, of background around the War of 1812 and uh, the theater of operations, which was the, the, you know, the right division for the British in, in uh, Upper Canada. Uh, we we'll talk about the march into captivity of, of the prisoners from that battle. Um, you know, the arrangements made in Chillicothe, Ohio for uh, holding of the prisoners and then uh, how the adjustments had to be made and, and a number of prisoners and officers were transferred to Newport, Kentucky and then Frankfort, Kentucky. And then we'll get into uh, what was called the, the cartel. You know, you know it was a, a formalized process negotiated between the US government and the British government around prisoner exchanges, paroles and, and various details. And then um, we're also going to see, it was kind of a bizarre event, a series of retaliations between the British and the Americans around prisoners, which derailed the exchange process and then ultimately led to a whole new pro process. And then finally, uh, we'll, we'll travel with the 41st back to Upper Canada and then talk about their arrival here. So the primary sources that I used, um, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Ernest Cruikshank, um, he was a, a Canadian Army officer, uh, early 20th century, also a historian. He did a lot of archival work around the War of 1812, and, and I, I think it's nine or ten volumes. His documentary history of the campaign and the Niagara frontier is, is just an amazing resource. And then uh, on uh, Chillicothe and Camp Bull, uh, Patricia Medart ha had a great book. 
Uh, and then a resource I drew heavily upon that's really hard to find. Uh, it, it was actually, I believe, a doctoral thesis written by Anthony Deitz on, on the prisoner of war in the United States related to the War of 1812. Uh, we use this source, the last talk, John Richardson, his, uh, his recollections of, of and experiences from the War of 1812. And then we'll look at some, uh, some details that, that come from the Public Records Office in, in the UK around, uh, you know, the 41st Regiment. So I'm going to have a base assumption here, you know, a little something around the War of 1812. And even if that's one of the years in, in which it occurred hint, 1812. Uh, Moravian Town, also known as the Battle of the Thames, happened in the theater of operations where the right division of the British Army in Upper Canada operated. To set the stage, we'll look at some of the key events that occurred there. We'll also look at what happened with prisoners that the, Brit that the British had captured within their activities within the right division. And finally, a quick exploration of the linkages between the state of Kentucky and the Wright Division, particularly the 41st Regiment, through these affairs of the Wright Division. So the Wright Division operated in what is known today as southwestern Ontario, and it also uh, covered southern Michigan and portions of northern Ohio. The headquarters at various times were in Fort Amherstburg in the township of Malden, which is Amherstburg now in Ontario, and Sandwich, which is in modern day Windsor, Ontario. So highlighting a few of the key actions in this theater helps to set the stage for the long running confrontation between the 41st and the American troops leading up to Moravian town where the vast majority of the 40, 41st regiments first battalion were captured. In one of the opening actions of the war, the U.S. sent a large army to what was their northwest frontier. They also occupied a good portion of southwestern Ontario, but as the British were beginning to respond, they lost heart and retreated into Fort Detroit, where they soon capitulated and surrendered to the British under the command of Major General Brock. U.S. regulars, primarily the U.S. 4th Infantry, and officers were sent to Quebec as prisoners of war, and then paroled several months later, and then exchanged in early 1813, which allowed them to be reactivated so they could serve once again in the War of 1812. Those prisoners traveled by water to Fort Erie and then marched along the Niagara River to Newark, or which is also known as Niagara-on-the-Lake today, and then were forwarded on to Quebec by water, where they were held in prison hulks, and they were soon to be joined by prisoners from the, the Battle of Queenston Heights. American militia, these were largely from Ohio, were paroled and escorted beyond the reach of the indigenous warriors and released. Hall's capitulation was viewed as a humiliation by the Americans that had to be reconciled and revenged. This takes us into early 1813, where the Americans were mounting an expedition to recapture Detroit with armies under William Henry Harrison and James Winchester through the early winter of 1813. American troops, many from Kentucky under Winchester, went to the River Raisin at the appeal of some local settlers. Uh, this community was also known as Frenchtown. When apprised of a major American army virtually on his doorstep, Proctor, the commander of the British forces, quickly organized a counterattack made up of various military and naval elements, but predominantly was the 41st Regiment and a large uh, supporting cast of indigenous warriors. The British won the action in a bloody affair, but Proctor, worried about rumors of Harrison approaching with his own army, hastily abandoned the village, leaving a number of wounded American prisoners behind with a, a very minimal guard. The, the indigenous still in the area of the village attacked and killed a number of the wounded prisoners that night. The American prisoners who were healthy enough uh, accompanied the British on their return to Malden. Ultimately, a large number of these prisoners were marched to Fort George in two waves where they were exchanged in the late winter and early spring, and they crossed over the Niagara River back into American territory. After the River Raisin, Harrison had a fortification built at the rapids on the Miami River. Uh, this is known as Fort Meigs. And it was uh, chosen to be at these rapids because they were the height of navigation from Lake Erie. As troops and supplies were being accumulated at Fort Meigs, Proctor thought the British could once again make a preemptive strike to further delay 
the Americans in their quest to recapture Detroit. A siege ensued, and then things really heated up when a column of Americans, primarily from Kentucky, were coming to relieve Fort Meigs and were directed to capture and destroy the British batteries opposite of Fort Meigs. At the same time, the Americans in the fort would sally forth and destroy a battery on their side of the river. Initially, the American tactics were quite successful. However, those on the opposite side of the river lingered too long at the captured batteries and some of their numbers pursued the indigenous into the woods. They were battered with the counterattack of both British and indigenous suffering numerous casualties and prisoners. The American prisoners were brought into the British encampment within the ruins of the old British Fort Miamis. There they suffered a number of deaths from from the indigenous. A private of the 41st Regiment, Patrick Russell, died trying to protect the American prisoners. Tecumseh ultimately intervened and stopped the killings. So here we can see a map of, uh, of Fort Meigs and the areas around it. There, In the circle there is uh, the structure, the, the, the large palisade encampment, which was Fort Meigs. And then you see batteries uh, to the top of Fort Meigs where, where the original you know, British siege works or, or batteries. And then they opened a second one, you know, to the right of Fort Meigs, which uh, gave kind of an enfilading fire. And then finally, to the right of the screen is the site of, of the old abandoned fort, Fort Miamis, which the British were using as their encampment. So an exchange of prisoners occurred just outside of Fort Meigs. Uh, a number of 41st soldiers were captured at the action on the battery on the Fort Meg side of the river. And then after this exchange, the siege soon unraveled as the indigenous returned to their encampments to celebrate their trophies and plunder that had been captured. And the Canadian militia slipped away to try to tend to their neglected farms. Proctor arranged for the majority of the remaining prisoners to be released in the area of Cleveland along the shores of Lake Erie. So as we move into the summer of 1813, Proctor was anxious to placate a growing number of in indigenous warriors accumulating in the area of Fort Amherstburg. Proctor was persuaded to mount a second expedition to Fort Meigs. The second siege of Fort Meigs, also known as Tecumseh's Sham Battle, was unsuccessful in drawing the American defenders out of Fort Meigs or bringing Harrison and additional soldiers to the relief of Fort Meigs. Frustrated, the combined British and native force moved on to Fort Stevenson on the Sandusky River, which was a small depot that was said to be lightly defended. Harrison had ordered the defenders to abandon the post, but the defenders refused. In a totally ill-conceived assault, Proctor sent forward columns of attackers with only axes to try to breach the palisade. The 41st Regiment suffered 27 killed and left behind a considerable number of wounded and prisoners. At the age of 21, George Crowen led the defense of Fort Stevenson. He was widely celebrated across the U.S. for leading the defense of Fort Stevenson against overwhelming odds. He was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And we'll see him resurface a little bit later in our narrative. So unable to dislodge Harrison and his growing strength in the Ohio area, and then faced with the launch of two new U.S. Navy ships, the Lawrence and the Niagara on Lake Erie, Proctor and Robert Barkley of the Royal Navy knew they were in a precarious position in terms of sustaining their position at Amherstburg. Barkley sailed forth to give battle to Perry and the American fleet. The Americans won a huge victory capturing the entire British fleet. Included in this capture were a number of soldiers from the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and the 41st Regiment who had been pressed into duty on board the British fleet to try to offset a profound shortage of experienced sailors. With the U.S. now in control of Lake Erie, Proctor could no longer sustain his position at Amherstburg and resolved to retreat back up the Thames River Valley. So those, some of you on the, the previous talk, this will sound familiar, but this is a, a much abbreviated version. Proctor orchestrated a confused retreat up the Detroit River to Lake St. Clair and then up the Thames River Valley. Proctor finally chose to make a stand a short distance below the Moravian village of New Fairfield. A line of 41st soldiers faced toward the expected American attack with their line anchored on the left by the Thames River. A second line of 41st were held in reserve some distance behind. Both lines were in a widely dispersed open order. 
Columns of mounted riflemen quickly roared through both British lines, pursuing Proctor and rounding up a large number of prisoners. The indigenous deployed to the right of the British lines offered a stout resistance up until the time of Tecumseh's death. Close to 600 soldiers and officers were captured, along with a considerable number of army wives and children. The Battle of the Thames shattered and scattered the right division of the British Army, giving control over Western Upper Canada to the Americans. The American Army withdrew back towards Detroit with its plunder and prisoners. Um, as a coincidence or irony or fate, a series of events and actions seem to inexorably link Kentucky and its soldiers to the 41st Regiment. At the River Raisin, the abandonment of the wounded and the resulting slaughter of the Kentuckian soldiers and officers inspire, inspired the Kentuckian battle cry of Remember the Raisin. At Fort Meigs, those attacking soldiers on the British side of the river were from Kentucky. Between Dudley's massacre and the murder of prisoners in Fort Miamis, a further point of animosity was created. In the fall of 1813, Harrison deliberately chose extremely motivated Kentuckians for his pursuit of Proctor in the 41st. Ultimately, the 41st were to spend the majority of their captivity in Kentucky. So based on the early war experience where most of the British prisoners were naval prisoners, the early stations for exchange were predominantly coastal cities listed on this slide. The one exception was the inland station of, and I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, Schenectady, <laughs> New York, which soon proved inadequate and was changed to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, you know, much easier to pronounce. The stations were for the facilitating exchange of prisoners, but there were also depots that were used for the gathering and holding of prisoners. An example was the government barracks at Greenbush, New York, where British prisoners taken from actions on the Niagara frontier could be held safely away from rescue attempts by British forces. Thomas Barclay, the British agent for prisoners, could not visit with the prisoners himself and used sub-agents closer to the prisoners to supervise their care and the provision of subsistence. After the Battle of Lake Erie, the U.S. Navy Commodore Perry had a large number of prisoners, but no nearby facilities to deal with them. He had sent them to Chillicothe deep in the Ohio Territory, which was also the capital of the territory and a principal recruiting center. The wounded were sent to Pittsburgh where more care was available for them. After Moravian Town, Harrison had the same problem. Chillicothe was tried, but it was overwhelmed and the bulk of the prisoners were moved on to the government barracks at Newport, Kentucky. On the British side, American land prisoners were held in Quebec in prison hulks. These were old warships converted into the use of floating prisons. They tended to be rotting, damp, and, and crowded environments. I stumbled across this account of the history of Quebec City in the past week as I was researching another topic. What I find noteworthy is um, 84 American prisoners who died in Quebec City and, and were buried in the Protestant cemetery. Here they call it St. John Street. Um, the Protestant cemetery on Rue Saint-Jean in Quebec is still a remarkable place to visit today. But unfortunately, if you do go there, there's very few surviving markers or monuments. So the British held many of the, the naval prisoners and a number of the land prisoners at Melville Island in Halifax. This photo is from 1901. Uh, you can see some buildings on the island. They burned down not, not long after this picture was taken. But Melville Island was, was the site where the, the British housed uh, prisoners in Halifax. As Melville grew overcrowded, prisoners were transferred to the primary station in England, with that being Dartmoor Prison. The island actually today is now the home of the Armdale Yacht Club. Seen here is Melville Island's accompanying Dead Man's Island with its memorial, which is the home to graves of 188 American casualties from the War of 1812. No longer an island, it's an easily accessed memorial park on a small peninsula. Dartmoor Prison in Devon, England was home at one time to close to 6,000 French and American prisoners. So, the U.S. government had no set infrastructure in place to deal with prisoners at the outset of the war. 
they decided to use an existing network of government agents. These were collectors of customs who were used to dealing with the arrival of vessels in U.S. seaports, and they could record and document vessels arriving and the prisoners they held. Marshals would maintain the custody of, of the prisoners until prisoners were exchanged, paroled, or released. British agents in the U.S., and these were formerly consuls made redundant by the declaration of war, would receive release prisoners and arrange for transportation back to British territory. The beginning of the war was marked by numerous captures of British ships by the US Navy and US privateers. The British held similar, but also held a number of US Army regulars captured at Detroit and Queenston Heights. For the British, naval prisoners were held at Halifax and military prisoners were held at Quebec. In 1812, there was a general willingness on the part of British Admiral Warren to exchange naval prisoners due to a scarcity of supplies in Halifax. The Americans lacked facilities and an infrastructure to deal with prisoners and readily agreed to an exchange and also sought to expand this to the military prisoners being held at Quebec. Governor General Prevost quickly agreed. To facilitate the exchange of prisoners and to set conditions for their treatment in captivity, John Mason, the American Commissary General of Prisoners, which was a function of the Secretary of State, and Thomas Barclay, the British agent for prisoners held in the U.S., entered into a series of negotiations to build a formal agreement or, or, or a cartel. The, the actual document is some 4,000 words. I've taken the liberty of offering a, a rather condensed version. So, you know, the first article says that prisoners are to be treated with humanity and exchanged as quickly as possible. And there is actually a, a table of rates saying that the value of different ranks. Uh, the second article, non-combatants should be immediately released without a requirement for exchange. The third article talked about the establishment of stations or depots, as well as agents. The fourth had a, talked about what a parole form would look like and the conditions associated with it. Uh, the fifth article talked about a parole that included a return to the prisoner's home country. The sixth article talked about violations of parole. The seventh article uh, specified no physical mistreatment and then talked about what kind of discipline could occur. I'll pause just for a second, you know, you know, people that maybe aren't familiar with the time period might not understand the notion of parole. And, and this is something that's going to come up a lot through this talk. And that means, uh, particularly for officers, you, you know, they would pledge against their honor that they would not try to escape or return and they would not enter back into comment or into combat. So until they were exchanged, they had become a non-combatant. And in this time period, honor was very important to these gentlemen and not something they would readily violate. So uh, the eighth article talked about, um, you know, the prisoners held in every facility were candidates for exchange and they couldn't be withheld for exchange without proper justification. The ninth had details around the ships or vessels used. The tenth, how to pay for those vessels. The eleventh talked about uh, naval commanders landing prisoners under a flag of truce. So essentially uh, an administrative requirement, recording the prisoner details that they'd released so they could accumulate credits for the exchange of prisoners from their own side. The 12th talked about sending prisoners ashore in neutral vessels. 13th, um, more of the administration associated, you know, maintaining uh, lists of prisoners, those being held, those on parole, those that were exchanged and free to serve in the army again. The 14th uh, talked about how each country could reserve the right to send no more prisoners if they felt the exchange ratios were out of balance. And the 15th, uh, said the cartel document was provisional and needed to be ratified by both governments. Unfortunately, both governments had reservations and did not immediately sign off on the agreement. However, exchanges and prisoner arrangements for care were set up around the principles of this document. That is until we run into the group known as the Queenston 23. So, before we return to the Queenston, Queenston 23, well, we'll take a quick break. I can catch my breath, have a drink of water, and then Chris, maybe you can offer a few questions that may have accumulated. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. So the first one um, comes from Mike Morton. Hi, Mike. Welcome. Um, he, and he was pointing out um, that, um, first off, Winfield Scott was captured at uh, Queenston Heights and was paroled fairly quickly afterwards. And Mike, that's a interesting topic because I've asked the question before of um, once he's been paroled, what happened to him afterward? I mean, we know what happened to him in 1814, but Anyway, that's a topic for another conversation, perhaps. Uh, but Mike also asked a question. Um, Tom, you brought up the number of women and children that were captured at the Battle of the Thames. And I think you kind of hinted at it. But were they um, basically paroled right away? Uh, what, what exactly happened to them? No, well, we will encounter them again as we go through this. Remarkably, the women and children followed uh, their soldiers into captivity and, and were held in these prison camps in the U.S. Interesting. So, so hang tight, Mike. We'll come back to that. Um, and then, uh, not a question, but I, I did want to call people's attention. Um, um, I think it's Keith Minsinger. Um, it, it says KE on YouTube. Um, and he points out that Pittsfield's prisoners were held in a building that had been built as a boarding school, which is interesting. Um, just before Tom, while you're still catching your breath, um, <laughs> for those of you that didn't notice, I did put a, uh, a note in the chat, um, but Tom wanted me to point out that um, the entire um, workshop today will be uh, probably a little over an hour. Um, so if you feel you need a break at any point or, um, you know, you need to stop, you've got something else on, um, you're able to pause the video, um, come back to it later. Um, or if you join us late as well, um, you don't have to just watch it live. You can go back to the beginning and, and watch from the beginning. Um, so please feel free to come and go as you see fit. Um, but um, thank you to everybody for those questions. And feel free to keep them coming. Tom will pause again in a few minutes, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I did, did see one here where uh, David Hobden was asking about U.S. prisoners sent to Dartmoor. I, I think those are the kind of uh, when Melville got overfilled, they were primarily naval prisoners, although uh, he talks about British Army deserters, and that is a good segue to the Queenston 23, who we're going to encounter right here. So uh, the relatively easy flow of exchanges stopped dramatically when it was learned that 23 American prisoners captured at the Battle of Queenston Heights were declared British citizens and sent to England to stand trial for treason. The U.S. immediately placed 23 British soldiers in close confinement and declared their lives forfeit if any harm should come to the 23 American prisoners sent to England. In response, Governor General Prevost had 46 American soldiers being held in Canada, placed in close confinement to account for the 23 British just placed in confinement in the U.S. Here started successive rounds of retaliation that soon saw all the British officers held in the U.S. have their paroles revoked and placed in close confinement. A sense for the feelings around retaliation might be best found in this letter found in the papers of John Mason, held at Gunston Hall in Virginia. It was written by an officer of the 41st Ridge Regiment being held in Frankfort, Kentucky, Lieutenant Benjamin Geale. He was writing to his brother, Piers. Uh, it's from within the walls of a prison, your unfortunate brother addresses you. Retaliation for American officers confined in Canada by order of the Prince Regent has compelled the American government to adopt the same measure. The cause of our confinement is in consequence of 23 British subjects that were taken in arms against us at the Battle of Queenstown and were sent to England to stand their trial. The American government then put in close confinement 23 of our soldiers to answer with their lives. For the safety of those men who were sent to England, an order has recently arrived to Governor General Prevost to put in close arrest 23 American officers and non-commissioned officers to answer in the above manner for the 23 British soldiers closely confined by the Americans. This is the system of the day and the innocent will suffer for the guilty. This perhaps is the last letter you ever received from me. If the men in England are executed, my days will shortly after conclude. To you then, my dear brother, do I confide the care of my dear wife and child, 
copy of my will shall be sent to you, and I'm well aware that you will continue the same fatherly affectionate care to your beloved and precious charge that you have ever evinced towards me. And may the God shower heavy vengeance on those that are the cause of this calamity, which threatens us with the most degrading and untimely death. What a war this is likely to be, the recital of which will disgrace the pages of history. However, thank God I die with honor to myself and country. My colonel and 17 more of my brother officers will end their days on the scaffold with me, and the business will end with the execution of every officer and man that is in the possession of the two contending powers at present, and then that fall in their hands for the future. I'm sorry now that I escaped the honorable death of a soldier to meet that of a criminal. As all my letters are read, I must omit many circumstances that I could wish to recite, and that throughout God of heaven may ever protect both your family and my beloved wife and lovely infant shall be the expiring prayer of your affectionate and truly unfortunate brother. So with this background and context, we'll return to the prisoners captured at Moravian town and then perhaps a little insight as to their mental state and why immediately after the battle, uh, we started seeing a large number of desertions from the soldiers of the 41st Regiment. Um, all were marched back along the route of retreat to Sandwich. Um, the officers who pledged parole were loaned pack horses to ride from Detroit past Fort Meigs to Chillicothe. The troops were marched this same route. Those who did not ride took the Ariel, a U.S. vessel from Sandwich, to put in bay and then up the Sandusky River where they secured horses and carried on to Chillicothe. Richardson, a gentleman volunteer with the 41st Regiment, was traveling with the officers and wrote much about the rain and cold endured on the trip and the lack of warm clothing due to the baggage having been plundered by the Americans and their own followers. From the Proctor Court Martial transcripts, the testimony of Lieutenant John LeBreton of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, who was traveling to meet with Harrison under a flag of truce at Proctor's request, offers this interesting incident. In the morning, about 22 miles from Sandwich, I saw nine or 10 men of the 41st. I asked them what they were doing there. They replied that they had been taken prisoner and were on their way to Sandwich in a boat, but had been landed at this place for some time. They complained of having been a considerable time without provisions. When asked what escort they had, they replied none. I tried to convince them to return with me as they appeared to have been abandoned by the enemy. They refused and one said, I have been long enough a slave and am now determined to have my liberty. So I guess the prospect of going to an English speaking country and escaping their service in the British army was just too much to resist. So following the route of the prisoners, you can see those by water to uh, you know, the area of Sandusky Bay and then up to Chillicothe and then those that went from land through Fort Meigs on to Chillicothe. You know, the distance, uh, especially for those that went all the way to Frankfort, Kentucky encompassed uh, a thousand kilometers. That's the, the equivalent of the distance from London, Ontario to Quebec City, which is quite a substantial area. So the first wave of prisoners were 300 seamen and Marines, you know, this being the soldiers of the 41st and Royal Newfoundland Regiment, along with 20 officers from the Battle of Lake Erie. Ohio didn't have facilities to deal with them. The nearest community that might was Chillicothe. The officers were there first, along with 20 rank and file of the 41st that had been captured earlier that summer at Fort Stevenson. Officers had paroles arranged and found accommodation in homes in the community. Uh, it was hard to find space for the prisoners. There was no state prison. The community jail was far too small. So they created a tent camp on some appropriated land near the river somewhere around October 24th, 1813. A more permanent structure was to be created. This was to be Camp Bull. There was no local British agent to assist in the care and provision of the prisoners. So the local marshal reluctantly provided five blankets for every six prisoners. The U.S. also had difficulty with creating guards. Uh, there were no nearby regular troops. And local militia were proving to be undisciplined, undependable, and even described as troublesome. 
The current structure under construction was barely adequate. And then word came that a further 600 prisoners from Moravian town were soon to arrive. So we see in, in this letter to the Niles Register, a, a Baltimore newspaper from the time period about the, the prisoners about to arrive, 600 prisoners captured from his majesty in Canada by the gallant Harrison and his brave backwoodsmen arrived here this evening under the care of a boy immortalized as the hero of Fort Stevenson, the gallant, the intrepid Crowen. They will join their comrades taken with the Erie British fleet tomorrow at Camp Bull. So of course, Crowen was the officer in command of Fort Stevenson, who along with the lone gun, Old Betsy, shredded the British attack and caused numerous casualties in the ditches around the fort. Uh, was it coincidence or a deliberate choice for the command of the transfer of the prisoners of the 41st Regiment, further adding another indignity? I, I gave pause to wonder there. Another letter to the Niles Register uh, talked about you know, the women and children that, that were with the prisoners, and they described the officers all in town on parole, in general, dashing young bucks. Uh, so the thousand prisoners were far too many to sustain in this place. On November 13th, orders came from the Commissary General to transfer the prisoners to Newport. It was to be primarily the naval prisoners and the officers of the 41st to be left behind in Chillicothe. November 20th, Crowen continued on to Newport with his wards, leaving behind some paroled officers. The 41st prisoners went from Camp Bull in Chillicothe to Newport, a government barracks across the Ohio River from Cincinnati in Kentucky. So I want to take a moment or a pause and talk about the Great Escape, but this was a uh, War of 1812 style. A number of the officers of the 41st Regiment were still in Chillicothe. They were enjoying parole and a lot of relative freedom in the town. And this changed when they were placed in close confinement due to an escalation in, in the series of retaliations. The officers were also feeling a little anxious due to the construction of what they thought was a gallows outside their prison. Communication was opened up between the officers and then some of the rank and files still being held at Camp Bull by several of the senior NCOs who were allowed to visit the officers. The plot was hatched. The men in Camp Bull were to rise up late one night and overpower their guard and then split up into three groups. One group was to free the officers being held in the jail. Another was to secure boats for their escape on the river. And the third group was to patrol the streets of the town to discourage the citizens from assembling and interfering. The plan fell apart when the two local citizens who had previously been supportive of the prisoners had misgivings and disclosed details of the plot to the local authorities. The officers were handcuffed and transferred to close confinement in the prison in Frankfort, Kentucky. So you see they would go through Newport and then on into the interior of Kentucky to Frankfurt. So the Newport barracks, uh, they were newly constructed in 1803. They re replaced a structure called Fort Washington, which was across the river in Cincinnati, Ohio. Newport had become the recruiting center for Ohio and Kentucky and had to furnish equipment and soldiers for the Northwestern Army during the war. With the existence of barracks at Newport, it proved to be an ideal accommodation for the British prisoners. Now we'll turn to a little bit to the care of the prisoners while they're in, in a place like Newport. Each prisoner was to be furnished by the government in whose possession they may be with the subsistence of sound and wholesome provisions consisting of one pound of beef or 12 ounces of pork, one pound of wheat and bread, and a quarter of a pint of peas or six ounces of rice or a pound of potatoes per day to each man and of salt and vinegar in the proportion of two quarts of salt and four quarts of vinegar to every hundred days subsistence. In terms of clothing, each prisoner was provided with two shirts, a vest, a jacket, a pair of trousers or overalls, two pairs of yarn sark, socks or stockings, one pair of shoes, a handkerchief and a hat. These were to be made from the strongest, coarsest materials so as to last the longest. Once distributed, clothing became the property of the prisoners and it was only replaced if it proved to be necessitated by natural wear. Selling, trading, or destroying this clothing meant they had to do without. 
uh, blankets were loaned to the prisoners and actually considered to be the property of the British government. Uh, ultimately, the allocation increased to two blankets for every three men. Uh, I scratch my head at this and I wonder what the third man was to do without a blanket, but oh well. Uh, further from the writings of Thomas Barclay, the agent for prisoners, Although women and children are not allowed to follow the army in the field, perhaps it's not strictly correct to allow them blankets. Still, humanity at this season of the year pleads too strongly in their favor to withhold the comfort. To each woman not having a child or more than one child, deliver a blanket. And where they have two or more children, a blanket to the woman and a blanket to every two children. These blankets are to be accounted for the same as those delivered to the men. The subagent also issued an allowance for the purchase of small necessaries. They also arranged for Bibles delivered through a local Bible society. Few men kept the Bibles. Most sold them and used the proceeds for the purchase of whiskey, prompting the agent to say, a more wicked and abandoned lot of men I never saw. Looking at what their daily life might have been like, the prisoners were mustered in roll called three times a day a half hour after sunrise, at noon, and again at sunset. The prisoners were divided up into units of 30, which were called wards. Each day, the steward, who was an administrative assistant for the deputy marshal, selected four prisoners in each ward for what was called policing details. Three would be employed in sweeping out the quarters and keeping the beds neat and orderly. The fourth would join other force, sweeping the yard and re removing refuse. On Wednesdays and Saturdays, weather permitting, the rooms of the prison, the clothing and bedding was washed and fumigated with vinegar and then aired. The deputy marshal would select two inspectors from each ward who would keep order in their respective wards and the yard. When in the yard, prisoners were expected to conduct themselves with decency and propriety, swearing, fighting, quarreling, and exciting strife or uproar was strictly forbidden. Each ward was divided into five messes of six prisoners each. At a stated hour each week, one of the prisoners from each mess met with the steward at their specified time to receive the rations for his mess. The prisoners were held accountable for the government property issued to them. Every prisoner was issued a note detailing the property, uh, such as cooking utensils and blankets. The prisoner was obliged to produce this property for inspection by the steward upon his request. Any damage or missing property would result in the prisoner being put in close confinement and suffering a reduction of his ration by one third until the debt was repaid. The prisoners were also held accountable for damage to the rooms of the surrounding facilities. Damages were repaid by a reduction in rations for everyone in the ward. If the ward were to disclose the name of the responsible party, then only that individual would suffer the reductions. Prisoners were forbidden to sell or buy their rations or furniture or dispose of them by gambling. Private citizens were not allowed to visit the prisoners or have any contact with them unless there was a written ticket from the deputy marshal or a special permission from the commanding officer of the camp. Letters or objects could not pass out of the prison without inspection and approval by the deputy marshal. A small number of discrete prisoners were chosen from the non-commissioned or warrant officer ranks to act as ward masters. Ward masters were supposed to be helpful in the maintenance of order. They also served as a conduit between the town and the prisoners. They could take prisoners' money and make purchases on their behalf in the town, and also dispose of any items that the prisoners may have manufactured. Every Tuesday between 10 and 12, the prisoners were able to hold a market in the compound the steward would closely monitor the sale to make sure the prisoners were not taken advantage of and also to prevent the prisoners bartering for ardent spirits, tools, arms, or other articles that could affect the safety of the prison or the morality of the prisoners. Penalties for other infractions were close confinement, reduction of rations, and potentially the loss of one's turn for exchange. Prisoners were not to be subjected to physical punishment, although Patrick Kelly, a private soldier of the 41st Regiment, was killed at the Newport Barracks on 24th of December, 1813, when attacking a guard. An excellent example of punishment comes from Pittsfield, where a number of naval prisoners from the fleet in Lake Erie ran afoul of American authorities. Forty of them were confined in the guardhouse on a diet of bread and water. Their punishment, after breaking into the hospital storeroom, 
and stealing away the liquors and wines on which they got uproariously drunk in threatened revolt. There were numerous incidents of escape by the British prisoners. In some instances, this was, was an, a, an attempt to return to the British ranks, but the Americans would also characterize escape as an attempt to leave the prison or prison camp to desert to the US. Most seemed to occur on the march or in movements of the prisoners or when there was a major move pending. The British would frequently complain that the American agents were careless in their guarding of the prisoners were possibly outright engaged in encouraging defection. The American response was it was difficult to stop the escapes and they certainly did nothing to encourage them. And in fact, each escape would mean that it would be potentially longer an American would have to remain in captivity. The Americans also claim there were strict orders not to permit British prisoners to enter US military service. Although this was not necessarily the case as a deputy marshal in Chillicothe wrote to Mason reporting that 20 prisoners had enlisted in the American service. <coughs> so let's now return to the officers. Due to a requirement for close confinement because of the retaliations, they were held in the Frankfort, Kentucky jail. They were not the only prisoners in this facility. The next slide highlights some local prisoners who shared this accommodation with them. So that's a uh, quite a colorful cast of characters in the prison with these officers from the 41st Regiment. All right, we're at another uh, break point and then uh, we'll see if there's any questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, we've actually got um, quite a list of, of questions. I'm um, um, just scrolling back to try to find the first one. Um, from Arturo um, asked just before you finished the last break and I missed it. Uh, but he was wondering if indigenous prisoners had um, ever exchanged or had any parole rights. I don't, I don't recall any accounts of indigenous prisoners. So I, I think, uh, I think the long standing animosity between uh, the Americans, particularly the, the frontiersmen and, and the indigenous uh, <laughs> meant that either the indigenous escaped or, or they had been killed. Uh, I'd be curious if anyone has any information or examples, but, but I had not come across any examples of them being held in captivity. Thank you. Um, so Marcus asks, um, was revoking an officer's parole, parole seen as a rather extreme act. I mean, it was an honor, honorable agreement at the time um, between gentlemen. So was this rather an extreme thing? Like, was it seen as an ex extreme if that was necessary? Uh, I would think so. Paroles were, were quite common and generally respected, but I guess going back to the circumstances around the, the Queenston 23, um, that that whole thing, the, the the retaliations, and the the threat of executions was was extreme in itself too. And related to that, did any officers not give their parole? Um, not uh, they could very well have been, but I I don't think so. I, I hadn't heard of, of that. Okay, thank you. Um, so then um, turning um, to a few questions about um, sort of the rations and the supplies, would the rations that you mentioned have differed based on the soldier's rank? No, I think if there's difference in facilities or from day to day, it was the availability. And, and that's why there were some equivalents, you know, in those lists. And then as the war continued, um, were those rations hard hit? Did they diminish as the British uh, blockades took effect later in the war? Uh, no, not, not that I'm aware. Yeah, if you look at it, it's, it's local foodstuffs, which I don't think would have been impacted by, by the blockade actions. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, David um, is asking, um, who supplied the clothes? Were they su supplied by the cap, the captors, or by the soldiers' own government? 
Uh, it's not clear, you, you know, so the, and nor is it, so I guess they became the property of the prisoners that that was laid out there. Uh, you know, the, the British had agents throughout the U.S., you know, working on, on the substance of, of the prisoners. I, I, I'm not clear if it was, uh, you know, the assumption was the Americans would provide clothing for the British captives and the British were doing the same for the Americans. It, it may be an instance like that. Okay, thank you. Um, so you also talked a little bit about that market uh, that the soldiers were allowed to hold. Are there any examples of surviving um, items that the prisoners had made themselves that you know of? I've seen images um, and, and I think they were from, um, from Halifax and, and, and stuff that, that had been made by captives on, on Melville Island. So uh, a lot of carvings and, 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 and different pieces like that. So no, that there is, um, if I had more time, I had a thought to, to go searching for some of those images because it is a fascinating aspect. Mm -hmm. I believe there, um, I, I think I mentioned last time that some of the um, American prisoners, um, especially the naval prisoners, were held in Edinburgh at the castle. And I believe they have a few items there. Specifically, they would do carvings on uh, bones, um, such as beef bones and stuff like that from the rations. So I think they've got a couple. Um, Turning to Ross quickly, uh, what was the highest rank of officer captured? Um, I assume Ross is talking about um, in in sort of the region we're talking, not in general. Uh, yeah, and we'll get into that in a moment. There were some some generals that captured on the American side, and it seemed like that the most senior field officer rank on the British was lieutenant colonel, or at least the the, the ones that that I touch upon. Um, and I'm, I'm scrolling through to some new questions that have come up while you've been answering them. Um, turning back to Mike Morden again, he's asking about uh, paroling of the militia. Would they have to sign something, um, make some sort of pledge? Um, they, they would have to make a pledge. There were certainly lists. I, I don't know the, the education level. A lot of them were, were capable of signing. Uh, you know, there's a great book, um, is it, uh, was it John Shepard? Shepard, uh, and it was. It talked about. Uh, I'm going by by memory. Plunder, parole, and, and something or other. But he talked about a lot about the Upper Canada militia and with the capture of York and a sense that the local militias almost volunteered to come in and give their parole so they didn't have to fight in the war anymore. So. <laughs> Um, I'm just taking a, a quick look. There's, there's some discussion between uh, people watching. So um, some really interesting discussion on some of the prisoners and, um, and on Dartmoor prison earlier. Um, did any of the British POWs um, simply disappear into the local community, Paul's asking. So uh, become um, Ohioans in their own right. Ultimately, Kentucky. yeah, ultimately the, the desertions and, and, and what we'll see a lot more of them, you know, whether from the camps or as they were starting to be either being prepared to return to Upper Canada or on the march back to Upper Canada, then those desertions were basically British soldiers seeking their freedom in the U.S. So I, it's funny, um, you know, as you're listed as a contact on, on the website, you know, back in the day on the 41st website, I remember getting an inquiry from someone looking for information about their ancestor. And they had the, this rather fancified view that they were in the 41st regiment. And then upon discharge, traveled back to Canada and ended up settling in the U.S. And, and then as I went through the records I held, I saw that they actually, they had been captured at Moravian Town and then deserted while in captivity in the U.S. So, so there was no record of them ever being discharged, but somehow that this family history had become that, that, you know, they weren't a deserter, so. Um, and related to that, um, I'm just going to do one more and then I'll let you get back into it. Um, David asks, um, 
Do you feel the large enlistment bounties offered late in the war by the U.S., they offered uh, $50 for soldier. Do you think that caused desertion on the British side? No, I, I'll kind of touch on it. Uh, I, I can't help but wonder is, uh, you know, are especially those soldiers that had enlisted for life, you, you know, the, like the prospect of traveling a thousand kilometers back into regular army service couldn't have been too appealing. You know, the, I, I think that was probably more of, a, of an incentive. And then uh, I'll say it again, to be in an English speaking environment where you could easily integrate into local society, especially Ohio, Kentucky, you're on the frontier, that they're not heavily developed areas. And, and, and that there was, I guess, a lot of prospects for the idea that you know, they could try to, to settle and take up a life there. Okay, thank you. So just um, as the questions keep coming in, um, just so people know, there's a bit of a delay. So if I don't get uh, to your question right away, um, we'll, we'll make sure we get to it. All right, we're coming down the home stretch here. Um, and then there'll be another opportunity as, as we wrap up the talk to manage a few more questions. So uh, Thomas Barkley, you know, the British, uh, you know, agent and then John Mason on behalf of the U.S. government worked diligently at, at a large wholesale exchange of all land prisoners through much of 1813. And they were using the, the articles of the cartel as a basis. Uh, this bogged down and did not occur largely due to the tensions associated with the escalating series of confinements due to the retaliations. It was in this dynamic that the men and officers of the 41st Regiment seemed hopelessly lost with no opportunity for exchange. A breakthrough occurred in early 1814 when Sir George Prevost allowed the three most senior American officers in captivity, all generals, to change their status to restricted parole rather than close confinement. One of these men was General William Henry Winder, captured at the Battle of Stony Creek, who was also granted permission to visit his family in the U.S. on a 60-day parole. Winder had offered to Prevo to talk to his government about easing some of the rounds of retaliation, the U.S. government was already feeling that Barclay could not negotiate anything without consulting Prevost, so they utilized Winder to propose a new round of negotiations. However, they wanted Winder to be their agent in these negotiations. They also wanted him to be released so that he could negotiate as an equal rather than a prisoner. Even in advance of these negotiations, the U.S. had already softened the terms of confinement for officers of field officer rank in the US. For the 41st, this worked out to be Lieutenant Colonel Augustus Warburton and Lieutenant Colonel William Evans, along with Brevet Major Adam Muir. Captain Peter Latouche Chambers was also allowed out of confinement to be with his family who were living in the immediate area of Frankfurt. With the release of Winder, the US then released the field officer closest in rank to Winder who was Lieutenant Colonel Warburton. The same privilege was soon granted to Evans and Muir based on the intercession of some senators from Kentucky who asserted they had shown particular care for American prisoners prior to their own capture. A general lessening of tensions began to take place. So Prevost released additional American field officers for parole in the U.S., President Madison, seeking to offset the bitterness associated with the escalating rounds of retaliation, then ordered that all British officers being held on American soil be given the opportunity to take a three-month parole for the purposes of returning to Canada if they should so choose. However, officers in remote depots, such as the 41st officers in Frankfurt, were concerned about the time that would be consumed for travel back to Canada and then back to Frankfurt. They were then offered the opportunity to return to Pittfield in Massachusetts rather than Frankfurt, which was a much closer distance. Against this background, Winder returned to Quebec in March 1814 to engage in a new round of negotiations with Prevost Adjutant General Edward Baines. Another wholesale exchange of land prisoners was again attempted, but it soon bogged down again with the status of the Queenston 23. 
Winder, acting outside of his mandate and his authority, offered to exclude the Queenston 23, the 23 British being held in the US, and the 46 Americans being held in Canada. A convention was signed on April 15th, 1814. Uh, looking at the Niles Weekly Register again, uh, we see this letter from the Adjutant General's office at headquarters in Montreal, April 16th, 1814. On the 15th instant, articles of a convention entered into by Colonel Baines, Adjutant General to the Forces, and Brigadier General Winder of the Army of the United States of America for the mutual release of all prisoners of war, hostages, or others, and shall be declared respectively all and severally to be released and free to carry arms and serve on the 15th May next, the same as if they had never been prisoners of war. The American government disagreed with Winder's negotiated agreement and sent him back to renegotiate the release of the 46 American retaliation prisoners held in Canada. Upon his return to Quebec, Winder discovered the British had already begun the return of a significant number of American prisoners. Not wanting to disrupt the flow of American prisoners, Winder ignored his instructions and returned to the U.S. without re-entering negotiations. Upset with Winder, the U.S. government once again ordered him to return to Quebec to renegotiate the convention. Winder chose to ignore his orders and to remain home with his family. He was soon after rewarded with the command of the military forces protecting Washington. The U.S. sent a new appointee, Tobias Lear, to renegotiate with Prevost. As Lear was in transit, he discovered that the Queensland 23 had been moved to ordinary confinement as regular prisoners of wars as the charges of treason had been dropped. The retaliation prisoners were all to be released. It was not until the 15th of June, 1814, that John Mason finally wrote to the Marshal of Kentucky, instructing him to prepare all the prisoners at Newport and the remaining officers at Frankfurt for their return. At long last, the 41st could return home. Or could they? By late summer, the British were upset by what they perceived to be an unreasonable amount of time to return the Chillicothe and Newport prisoners back into British hands. <clears throat> to avoid congestion at Upper Sandusky, it was decided to move the Newport prisoners first with those from Chillicothe to follow. Nineteen officers who had remained at Frankfurt were to accompany the prisoners from Newport. The initial plan was for all to leave as soon as the officers arrived at Newport. But a lack of transportation and subsistence delayed this until the end of July when 27 officers and their servants, 450 prisoners and 42 women and 61 children got underway. They arrived at Upper Sandusky on August 18th, meeting 280 prisoners from Chillicothe who had already been there since the beginning of August. Even though they frequently marched through heavy rains, there were few instances of sickness reported amongst the Newport prisoners at the time of their arrival at Upper Sandusky. <coughs> Despite plans put in place back in June, no boat transportation was available for taking the prisoners across Lake Erie. They were, according to the negotiated exchange, to return to Fort Erie. But a major military operation under General Jacob Brown had seen requisitioned all available naval vessels on Lake Erie and Fort Erie was being held in American hands. The delay caused considerable hardship as there was limited or inadequate blankets and clothing for the prisoners who were camped along a stagnant and swampy section of the Sandusky River for just over a month. The unhealthy circumstances and short rations resulted in many illnesses and deaths. Relief finally came for a portion of the prisoners and their families when a boat arrived at the end of September and 144 of their number were taken across the lake to the township of Woodhouse, which is in the area of Long Point Bay or Port Dover on uh, the upper Canada Lake Erie shore. The rest of the prisoners were transferred to Cleveland where it was hoped it would be easier to secure transportation across the lake to Long Point. This was not solidified until late in the fall and severe weather hampered the ferrying operations. Washington was not aware of the, the delays and the issues until mid-September and urged every haste to complete the transfer, fearing Prevost's interpretation of the whole affair and possible retaliations. Prevost wrote to Madison complaining about the delays and hardships endured by the prisoners. Prevost described the, the, the delays as being due to frivolous pretenses the connivance of the American government, and the misconduct of their officers. <clears throat> 
Brigadier General Duncan MacArthur, whose troops formed the guard for the prisoners, pointed out the point of transfer, Fort Erie, was actually in American hands, and the government would have to choose a new point. An action certainly not beyond his scope. Uh, MacArthur certainly proved resourceful a little bit later that fall in October and November when he led 700 men in an extended raid across much of Western Upper Canada. General Drake, Jacob Brown had expressed a concern to MacArthur that if the transfer of prisoners occurred too quickly, the enemy would be strengthened at an inopportune time. The plight of the prisoners and the delays are captured in a number of letters found in, in Crookshank's documentary history. Tom, can I pause you for a second? Yeah. Um, sorry, I think we might have lost you for a second there. We, uh, um, we cut out for a second. Um, I'm not sure if it was just me or if it was the YouTube channel as well, but could you go back to the back last slide for a second? Which one? This one? Yeah. And then uh, I just missed the second half um, when you were talking about Jacob Brown and MacArthur. Okay. So Jacob Brown expressed a concern to MacArthur that if the transfer of prisoners occurred too quickly, the enemy would be strengthened at an inopportune time. The plight of the prisoners and the delays are captured in a number of letters found in Crookshank. That get us caught up? I think so. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So from Lieutenant Clements of the 41st Regiment to his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Evans, at Cleveland, their situ situation was shocking, many being sick without any medical attendance, and they were encamped without tents or any covering in the most bleak and cold situation that could be picked out. The men complained that they were half starved and did not receive their rations regularly, and that they got was what they did get was not fit to be eaten as it smelt and was unwholesome. Richardson wrote of officers selling aspects of their clothing to buy the common necessaries of life. From Woodhouse, Upper Canada, 22nd, September 1814. This morning, eight officers and 136 women and soldiers arrived from Kentucky, being the first division of prisoners taken on Lake Erie and at Moravian Town. The men are almost naked, most of them without shoes, and many are suffering from fever and ague. From Long Point, 7th October, 1814. The further we advance, the scene of misery deepened, and from wretchedness we arrive gradually to the essence of everything miserable, nakedness, uncleanliness, disease, and death. I should not have objected to have taken a single countenance under my care, but the poor fellows were anxious to get on, and then, although barefooted and naked, I allowed them to go where they could get some comfortables. From Major Muir back in Upper Canada, on the 27th of September, I went to Long Point where I arrived on the 30th. I found nearly a quarter of those who had crossed over in all the different stages of sickness, even to death itself. On the 25th of October, three vessels were anchored in the bay and a boat came ashore, and I was informed that the prisoners were on board, but that many of them were sick. Soon after, the boats arrived at the beach, with some dead, others dying, and one half of them unable to help themselves in any manner whatever. In short, we lost six men and one woman that night, and it was the doctor's opinion that, that not one in 20 who were called well would ever recover their strength and appearance. I was informed by the non-commissioned officers there was not a town they were marched through that they were not surrounded by a parcel of people offering them money and making use of every means to seduce them from their allegiance. So from the 41st Colonel Evans to Lieutenant Colonel Harvey, he talked about how the recruiting parties even went into the depots of Newport and Chillicothe where they induced a few men to enlist. And then finally, uh, the most prevalent diseases are intermittent fever of a most obstinate nature, remittent fevers of a bad character, and dysentery. The few men, and they are few indeed, who have had the good fortune to escape these destructive diseases, have a sickly, sallow complexion, and they are considerably emaciated and debilitated. So we see uh, the U U.S. Major General Izzard, uh, who had command of the Fort Erie area later in 1814, that he felt 400 exchange prisoners of the 41st Re Regiment had come back to Upper Canada and were immediately put on duty. 
So 400 immediately put on duty. So here's further evidence of the concern the Americans had around a sudden influx of returned 41st prisoners. Izzard knew the prisoners had returned at this point and felt they contributed to the affairs in the area of the Niagara River. But recall Muir's words to Evans in his letter. Not one in 20 who were called well would ever recover their strength. Even the supposed healthy were in no position to make a contribution. And this wasn't the, the 41st Regiment that, all, that was already in the Niagara region because they had been withdrawn to Kingston after the, the failed assault on Fort Erie. So turning to some of the, the archival information, um, my strengths don't lend themselves to statistical analysis, but, but I still think it's interesting to extract some information and try to interpret some trends. I've excluded the killed in action and then plotted deaths by months for the 41st into two groups, the prisoners and non-prisoners. And you'll see a period of very similar um, you know, mortality patterns. So that span from January of 1814 up until early August, uh, it, there really isn't a big variance between the two. Uh, you see some spikes in the non-prisoners around significant events. Uh, in, so something like Moravian Town, Fort Erie, um, deaths that weren't killed in action. And, and I think anytime you get a large body of men uh, preparing for an action just after an action, you know, they've been under considerable duress. They might be short rations. Uh, they might be extremely fatigued. And um, if their systems run down, then they may be susceptible to a rapid illness and death. Uh, but you also see quite a spike for the prisoners around the time they reached Sandusky and then returned home. So September through November 1814, it really uh, breaks the, the pattern of the deaths that we see. And then plotting desertions of the 41st, you can see the immediate impact of the days just after capture. So uh, October, November 1813, a, a very high number, all those prisoners that were now in American hands. Uh, and then from January to June 1814, it was relatively stable. And then from July to October, facing the prospects of a long return march home, uh, perhaps listening to many of the inducements to desert, or perhaps succumbing to the many deprivations suffered and looking for relief from them, uh, the desertion rate rises rapidly again. An interesting sidebar, um, John Dean, of, there we go, who was wounded and captured at the River Canard of the famed Hancock and Dean, um, and then held in captivity at Detroit. And then with the capture of Fort Detroit by the British, he was personally released by Major General Brock. This poor chap was captured again at Moravian Town, and then maybe just having too much of this routine, he was listed as deserted as of November 24th, 1813. So a final chart, um, looking at the 41st listed on, on the 1st Battalion's pay list for the fourth quarter of 1813, I was able to plot the status of the various rank and file by rank. It's interesting to note that the, ma the majority of the desertions were predominantly from the rank and file. 17% of them deserted as compared to 4% of the NCOs. Those captured and killed amounted to 91% of the regiment and how to wipe out a regiment. Um, fortunately, the remnants were able to join up with an understrength 2nd Battalion that was also serving in Upper Canada at the time. And they formed a, a newly constituted 41st Regiment uh, in the latter part of 1814. So wrapping this up, um, you know, as I started this, I thought I'd find evidence of abuse in prison, particularly in Kentucky, given the 41st relationship with Kentucky, but I could really find no evidence to support this. Uh, recruiting, inducements to desert were certainly considered violations of the proper treatment of prisoners in the day. And there's supporting evidence of this, including that letter from a marshal to John Mason. The location of Sandusky to hold the, the prisoners within sight of Fort Stevenson sure seems ill-conceived and, and potentially malicious, but it was also ready access um, to Lake Erie for the area of the Portage River and Sandusky Bay. Uh, 
It sure seems like it was a deliberate obstruction. The Americans penned up in Fort Erie. Why increase the strength of your opponent with 600 veteran soldiers? The Moravian town prisoners with the length of their marches and then the stalling and delays at Upper Sandusky and along the shores of Lake Erie certainly had one of the more horrific POW experiences of the war on the British side. Somehow I would think that even Jacob Brown would have been shocked with the sorry state of the 41st as they returned to Upper Canada after a year in captivity. And there we are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I have to point out, Tom, it, it appears um, from the comments on YouTube that it was uh, something at my end, not yours. So there was no interruption into your talk. So I apologize for that. Um, turning to, um, I think I had a couple questions. So on the return, um, uh, when the when the prisoners were returning, um, they were mostly walking then, were they? Uh, I think some segments were by, by boat. So from, from Newport uh, along the Ohio River uh, a ways and, and then uh, then I, I think that they would go by, by land, you know, until they got in that area of Upper Sandusky where there was, uh, once again, the, the, the river opened up and there was access to Lake Erie from there by, by boat. Um, do you have an idea, um, for example, when they were walking, how far would they travel per day? Do you have an idea of that? I do not have a sense. I, I, I think with women and children being with them, uh, I, I don't know that it would be a, a huge distance. Yeah, and especially as illness started to take its toll, right? Yeah, and, and in Ohio at that time was, I don't think there was a lot of developed roadways. There was references to, to, to the persistent rain and, and how muddy that the tracks were that, that they were trying to advance along, so. Mm-hmm. Um, from Greg Carrero, um, he's asking about um, Captain Thompson's company. Um, Captain Thompson was held at Cheshire in Mas Mas Massachusetts. Sorry, I always have trouble with that one. Um, do you know anything about that facility? Uh, no, I don't. So it, it would probably be similar to like Greenbush in New York, Newport Barracks, where, where it was American depots that, that were pressed into, into service to, to hold prisoners. Right. Um, and medically, um, the prisoners, um, if they're uh, certainly wounded after the battle when they're captured um, or later on when they're taking sick, um, were they given medical treatment? Um, were they left to fend for themselves? I know um, the surgeon of the 41st was part of the party, right? Um, so was uh, that your main source of medical attention? Hard to say. I, I would, and it's interesting that it wasn't spelled out in the cartel or the articles of the cartel, anything about medical care. Not that I recall, you know, there was a point in the presentation where he talked about the aftermath of, of the battle of Lake Erie and the severely wounded prisoners were sent on to Pittsburgh where there was a better level of medical care there. So I think from that, you can deduce that that medical care would be provided. It's hard to say what, the quality of it would be, but, but yes, the, there would be some support. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just seeing a kind of follow-up from Marcus. I think it's related. Um, and he's asking what the medical facilities would be um, in the camps. Did any of them have a regimental surgeon? So sort of a similar question that I think you uh, you've addressed. Yeah. I'm not sure if, uh, the 41st surgeon, Alexander Tom, if he was captured or any of the assistant surgeons, I don't think so because I think they would have been at the Battle of the Thames quite far behind, you know, the lines like on the, the far side of the ravine and Moravian town. So I, I would assume they, they would have gotten away with Proctor and, and some of the others. So I, I, I really don't know any, anything about the medical facilities or the degree of care. Okay, thank you. Um, Eamon, a really interesting question. He's um, 
he sort of asked specifically about the 41st, but I think it could be a, a wider um, question and I, I just lost it. Sorry, I'm looking for it. Um, there it is, sorry. Um, so he says, any idea how the 41st Regiment found out um, when the POWs deserted um, so they could record them as such on the casualty returns? Because of course that would affect pay and, and that sort of thing. So um, how, how would they know that? Well, at the one point, you know, the articles of, of the cartel talked about the administration and the, the, the regular exchange of information. So I, I would think it would be there because it's interesting that pay list uh, from 1813, uh, unless it was done, it, a good chance it was done retroactively. Uh, you know, Eamon himself might know more about record keeping in the era. But there were desertions already being listed there, which would have been not long after the, the fact, so. Um, so a related question um, from Mike, um, were soldiers, were they continue to be paid um, while they were um, in captivity, while they were POWs? Uh, yes, they, they were entitled to pay, as far as I know. And then those that, that deserted, you, you would see notations of, of the stoppage in their pay, you know, because, or it was forfeit or turned over to the, the, the paymaster or the, the, the agent, the financial agent for the, the regiment. Right. Thank you. Um, so just, um, I'm going to give, I think I'm caught up on the questions. Uh, but uh, I'll give it a second if anybody wants to add some more. Um, but just in the meantime, I'd like to say there is um, some fantastic discussion happening in the chat um, and some fantastic resources are being posted there as well. So uh, I know, Tom, you don't have time to really be looking at them right now, but I hope everybody else is paying attention. There's some, um, some great additional information that people are pulling in and really really speaks to um the audience that that you've got here tom there's some um, amazing knowledge on both sides of the camera yeah that, that's great the last talk i found uh, the chat was archived you know so i was able to go back and, and review it after the fact so it's uh it's interesting stuff and i you know i was we talked about setting this up we felt that doing a zoom forum with everyone on here um, would be unwieldy and we didn't have the financial resources to subscribe to the, the webinar type of, of zoom. So this seemed like the best way forward to, to, to manage a lot of people. And I think the chat with a moderator is a brilliant way to, to have a degree of interactivity. So it's uh it, it's nice to be able to, in real time, you know, have access to our audience. So, yeah, absolutely. And um, it, by the way, it, it's great that um, the um, the chat, as you say, is is archived, so you can still check in. But um, if people do have resources to share, please feel free to uh, post in the comments as well. Um, that's sometimes a little bit easier to find um, if somebody's looking back at the video and. Um, wanted to check out an additional website. Um, so please feel free to post um, the comments in the comments as well. All right, and lots of, uh, lots of very positive comments and, and thank yous, Tom. So um, once again, on behalf of Heritage Days, all of us at Heritage Days, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, once again, this was fantastic. Thank you. Well, it's uh, after that research and, and work all those many years ago, it, it's great to have a, a fresh audience to, to give access to this information. It's my, my pleasure to share it. So, And again, I'd like to say also to thank you to people. Um, we've had a few extra, uh, a few more donations come in today. Um, so a reminder that um, for Canadian donations, at least, uh, I'm sorry for our international people, I can't send tax receipts uh, overseas or to the US, but for our Canadian friends, um, I will get out tax receipts in the next few days. So thank you 
again to people who have donated. That's very much appreciated. And more resources being posted all the time. So thank you to everybody who's who's sharing their information as well. That's fantastic. Well, I go forward. I look forward to going to read the chat, maybe with a, a beer in my hand. I'll try to emulate <laughs> Greg Carrero's example. So. Yeah, you've earned it. You can go get one. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Shall we, we stop the stream? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, please keep track of us. I think we've got lots of interesting options and, and projects coming up in, in the time ahead. So take care. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.